because it wasn't the appropriate place. I just I can't take any farther than that. Would it made any difference if you had mentioned, did you ever mention it, for instance, to the president? You're briefing the president from August 6th on. I didn't, I didn't see the president. Um, I was not in briefings with him during this time. He was on vacation. You, you didn't I was see here. the president between August 6, 2001, and September 10th. I, I, well, no. Before saw him after Labor Day, to be sure. So you saw him September 4th at the principals meeting. He was not at the principals meeting. Well, you you don't Condoleezza see him. Rice, Condoleezza Rice. I saw him in this time frame, to, to be sure. Okay, I, I'm just confused. You see him on August 6th with the PDB. No, I do not, sir. I'm not there. Okay, you're not. The, when do you see him in August? I don't believe I do. You don't see the President of the United States once in the month of August? He's in, he's in Texas, and I'm either here or on leave for some of that time, so I'm not here. So who's briefing him on the PDBs? The briefer himself. We have a presidential briefer. So, But you never get on the phone or in any kind of conference with him to talk at this level of high chatter and huge warnings during the spring and summer to talk to him through the whole we month of him, August? We, we talk to him directly throughout the spring and early summer almost every day. But not in, in August. This, in this time period, I'm not talking to him, no. Does he ever say to Dr. Rice or somebody else, I want to talk to Tennant? Tennant is a guy that knows this situation, has been briefing me all through the spring and the summer. Tennant understands this stuff. His hair's been on fire. He's been worried about this stuff. Is that ever asked, or are you ever called on to? I don't have a recollection of being called, Mr. Romer, but I'm sure that if I wanted to make a phone call because I had my hair on fire, I would have picked up the phone and talked to the president. He's just never made. No. Pump It Out Radio, a conversation session with Robert Schottmeyer. Prior knowledge of 911. Who knew what when? Hi, Robert. Yeah. Hey, okay. So, yeah, I just, again, thanks a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you here. Like I told well, I, you. I, hmm? I, think, I think I'm probably the most knowledgeable person on planet Earth with respect to the attacks on 9-11 and, and what the intelligence agencies did or did not do before the attacks. You seem to have known all this stuff that people like Kevin Fenton and Anthony Summers and even Bob Graham and all those people have been talking about over the years and even those guys with the, uh, the Press for Truth guys there with Richard oh. Lee and everything. And you had already basically had this out <laughs> I don't know what year it was. No, but here's what happened. I had finished, I had started my book at, uh, in uh, April of 2004 when I, I was sitting right behind George Tenet in the 9-11 hearings, and I heard that guy lie right to me in his entire testimony. And you were sitting behind Tenet, yeah? Yeah, probably less than four feet behind Tenet. I had gotten there at four in the morning to make sure I'd be smack dab next to Tenet because I wanted to hear every word. I wanted to hear how the words were even annotated because I wanted to find out what did the guy know when did he know it? And uh, how could he explain why they had never given the information on Bihar and Hazen to the FBI? Yeah, that seems to be the big question is who knew what when, right? Yeah, I have all that. I knew, I found out every single bit of information. And that same thing can be applied to, like, say, Tennant, to Bush, to Ch to everybody. Like, who oh, knew what when? Uh, I don't know anything about Cheney, but I know that Bush was told on, on uh, August 24th that Midhar and Hazmi were in the United States, that they were going to take part in a huge terrorist attack, and the attack would be hijacking at least four airplanes, and the targets would be the World Trade Center Towers 1, Tower 2, the Pentagon, and the Congress. Now, that's what, uh, that's what Kenneth gave to George Bush on the 24th. And that's when he went... 20th. Are you talking about, is that what he gave him when he went and visited him at the ranch? Yes. So he gets, like, this is with uh, that guy I, I told you about, Jim D3100, who's really helped me a lot. He was telling me how, okay, George Tennant gets a memo or a message saying, Islamic fundamentalist learns to fly. Next day, he hops on a plane, he goes down to George Bush's ranch, and I guess, according to the White House memo that you could still find online through the archive, Tennant just went down there because he wanted to see the ranch, and according to Bush, everybody wants to see the ranch, right? He had just been there on the 17th. There was and, no reason to go down there on the 24th. 
And w- and when when the guy at the commission, I forget his name, was questioning Tennant of, did you tell Bush? Did you say Tim Romer? That was Tim Romer. Tim Romer, yeah. He says, did you tell Bush? Did you say anything to Bush? He's like, no, I never had any communication with him at the time. Well, he told him he was never behind talking. him when he said that huge lie. Well, not only that, but everybody in the room knew the guy was lying. Tennant turned around when the, when everybody went into a big commotion. Everyone was sitting there shaking their head, just saying, liar, liar. And Tennant turns around and looks at everybody like, I can lie all I want and get away with it, basically. I mean, he didn't say that, but you could just see the expression on his face. And that's why Romer, on, on the video, he has that he, long pause, because he knows, he, everybody knows he's lying. He's lying, and he was just, he was just, Romer was flummoxed. He couldn't believe it. And then, then Tennant comes back and said, and Romer says, well, why didn't you call him on the phone? Well, well first Tennant says, I, I didn't talk to him, because he's in Crawford, and I'm in Washington. And Romer says, why didn't you talk to him on the phone? And Tennant says, well, I did. I can't. I didn't call him on the phone, and I can't explain. I can't go beyond my explanation of why I didn't. And, I'm and, and the whole there. thing about his hair being on fire, and he's like, he said something about, well, if I had any reason for my hair to be on fire, I could have call, I could have contacted George any time I needed to, but I didn't feel I needed to. Well, here was the issue. The issue was the the CIA had been criminally sabotaging the FBI criminal investigations on the Cobalt. Uh, in January 4th, they had positively identified, in January 4th, 2001, they positively identified Walad Benatesh at the Kuala Lumpur meeting. At that time, they knew they had uh, photographed the guy at the Kuala Lumpur meeting, along with Midhar and Azmi and a bunch of other terrorists. And I, I'm absolutely sure that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was at that meeting, and I'm also sure that uh, Ramsey Ben El Sheba was at that meeting. And I'll tell well, you how that's on, on your website, operate, events on 9 11, you have Benatash, yes. you have Al Midhar, and Al Hazmi. But but I'm absolutely sure that uh, the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was at the meeting and Ramzi bin al-Sheba was at the meeting. One of the guys who was at this meeting was this guy called Hambali, which was a very famous Indonesian terrorist, uh, a terrorist organization that had been helped out when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had gone to the Philippines. Now, there, there's no way they're going to have the Afghan uh, terrorists and the uh, Indonesian terrorists get together without Khalid Sheikh Mohammed being there. That would have been an insult to Hambali. He would have gone to the meeting and said, this is your insulting me. Where's, where's KSM? He's my contact. Because he had already been contacting the guy when he'd been in the, in the Philippines and the Indonesian area. The meeting in Malaysia is where things really got big, right? Like, that was the big thing going on. All oh, yeah, eyes, and, and, all and eyes guess, were on that meeting. And guess where that information went? And, all the photographs went to Cooper Black and George Tennant. And guess where else they went? <laughs> The information on that meeting went to Louis Free, director of the FBI. Louis Free, the and lawyer for Prince that. Bandar and the BAE scandal. How convenient. Well, he was the director at the time, the director of the FBI. Mm-hmm. And guess what? In November of 2000, Safan asked Free, because he, he contacted the Yemeni station and contacted uh, and gotten nowhere with the Yemeni station. So he contacted Free and said, could you talk to the FBI and see if they know anything about a meeting in, in East Asia, Southeast Asia? And uh, did they know about this guy, Walad Benatesh? Well, of course they did. They knew all about it. And uh, now there's a couple of interesting things here. So Free tells Safan that the CIA has none of this information on Benatesh or any meeting in uh, Southeast Asia. But if you look at page 181 of the 9-11 Commission Report, it says that Free got the information from the CIA on this meeting, knew that uh, Khalid and uh, Naraf had been to the meeting, and I found out that uh, Free had the full name Khalid al-Midhar in his uh, daily briefing papers. This information also ended up on his January 4th daily briefing papers, and on page 238 and 239 of the DOJ IG report, it says that the NSA gave Free the same information in December of 99. So when Free, when Free tells Safan there's nothing, he already knew it. Now, I'll tell you one thing. So I, I, when I was talking to this FBI agent, I finally called him back in 2007, about August of 2007, and I said, oh, by the way, um, Steve, I've been doing some, oh, by the way, you should turn off your tape recorder for a few minutes. Well, I won't give the guy's last name. I'll just say Steve. I said, Steve, uh, do you remember when your boss, Stefan, talked to Louis Free and asked him if he would ask the CIA about any information on Benatesh or me and Kuala Lumpur? And uh, Steve said, oh, yeah, I remember that, Bob. I have a clear recollection of that. And I said, were you aware that Free at the time knew there had been me in Kuala Lumpur 
and knew that uh, while well, Benatesh had been at the meeting, or knew that Midhar and Hosni had been at the meeting, not Benatesh. He didn't know that Benatesh had been at the meeting, he hadn't given the information. But he knew that Midhar and Hosni had been at the meeting, and he stiffed his own criminal investigators. Now, guess what? The information that Safan had talked to Free is in Lawrence Wright's, uh, the account of FBI agent Safan in the New Yorker, which was in the New Yorker, the July 10th to the 17th issue, the 2006 issue. And this information that I just gave you was in the 9-11 Commission report and, and in the DOGIG report. And how many people saw all this information and, says, and said ex- absolutely nothing? Millions must have seen the New Yorker article, right? Well, you would think, yeah. And, and Lawrence Wright, in his book, is the first guy to say that Free had been contacted by Safan and asked this question. And, and then you wonder, well, why didn't, why didn't Wright put something in his book? And then you realize that Wright had never read either the 9-11 Commission report or the DOGIG report. He had just based his book entirely on interviews. Well, that's what I don't, I don't understand about uh, Lawrence Wright and his Looming Tower book. He basically, he was the one who outed Tom Wilshire as John, the CIA agent. Yes. That kept coming up. And then yes. he also, uh, he was the one who, uh, through Pat DeMauro, got the, the FBI guys starting to talk because basically they felt that they were being, in his words, shafted by history. Yeah. Uh, and, and so he was, the, he was the beginning of the real story coming out. Well, he was the kind of the, 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 the small hole in the dam where the water started leaking out of the dam. Unfortunately, my opinion is that he could have gone a lot farther than he did. He could, if he had gone back to the 9-11 Commission here, the, the, just the report, had he gone to the uh, DOJIG report. Now, the DOJIG report didn't come out until basically his book was out. But he could have gone to the 9-11 Commission report, and he could have looked up uh, Louis Free or the meeting in Kuala Lumpur and found immediately that Free had his information and then put in his own book that how, how can Free explain this? And uh, people, some people have called Safan and asked him about it, and Safan was trying to protect Free, and he said, well, uh, the information that I made, my request, went to Free's office. It could have been that Free didn't even see it, and that's absolutely bullshit, and I'll tell you why. Because Free, Safan, and O'Neill were on the deck of the coal in October of 2000 when the boat had been blown to smithereens as they were picking the bits of the body off the boat. So Tufan was there with Free and O'Neill. O'Neill, both. And oh. so uh, Safan and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Free had a personal relationship from that time. So if Safan had made a request through the FBI director, uh, director of the FBI's office, it would have gone directly to FBI Director Free. Now, in the article in the New Yorker, uh, the CI comes out and says, well, the, this account is not entirely accurate. It doesn't say exactly why they think it's not entirely accurate. So what was the CI up to when they said that? When, when the CI came out and said that the article is not entirely accurate, what they really meant was that Free had never contacted them at all. He already knew they had this information. He already knew if he contacted them, all he would be doing is giving them more information, or more information they could use as ammunition against them. They had already used, uh, apparently, they had already used some ammunition against him to tell him to keep this information on the call and forming in secret. So he knew they had something on him and didn't dare give him any more ammunition. So when Free got this request from Safan, he never went to the CIA, ever. And Free was the director of the FBI up until June or July of 2001? 2001, and he quits for personal reasons. And then, I can you imagine this? Free knows there's a gigantic attack. Guess what Free knew in June of 2001? That the CIA had moved a spy into his own organization, Tom Wilshire, and this spy was now criminally sabotaging his investigation of the coal bombing, and Free knew himself that he had criminally sabotaged his own investigation, so he couldn't blow the whistle on the CIA, so he basically quit to get the hell out of the whole situation. He thought that he must have thought that this was going to lead to a gigantic terrorist attack, and he didn't want to be blamed when, they, when the attack took place. So he just packed up and left almost instantly once he realized that. See, he left right after that June 11th meeting. Well, yeah, I always thought that was pretty uh, coincidental that, or pretty strange that Free left at the time he did. So now just at that very important moment in time when 
Free would have had knowledge. Then you get a new guy, Robert Mueller, who really doesn't know what's going on or what. No, he has. They had Picard for a few weeks. Or, or Thomas Picard, Picard too. Yeah, he's another character. That so he's another criminal. I think he's. But a guy then I thought it was very interesting that you know Free leaves the FBI. He must have knew stuff because of the whole money oh, really and everything leading up to it, and then, oh, the, 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 you the, know, the coal time. bombing and everything. And then he becomes Bandar's lawyer for the BAE scandal. Well, can you imagine this? Like he must have been taken care of pretty well. <laughs> from from April, the, the the warnings about the gigantic attack were just pouring into the CIA and FBI, or the CIA was actually giving some of this to the FBI. So, right, like that's what uh, Mark Rossini and people said. Like that was the big thing. Like the, the whole the 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 Malaysian meeting and the whole lead up with the Millennium uh, bomb, yeah. the the chance of Millennium bombings. Like this was like red alerts everywhere going off. So here's what I figured out. They had the meeting in Kuala Lumpur. The CIA, for some reason, didn't want any of this information to go to the FBI criminal investigators in, in the FBI. It went to Lewis Free, but didn't go beyond that. And they had apparently had enough uh, uh, persuasion with Free to tell him to keep his mouth shut. And then Free tells Safan that the CIA has none of this information. So, so Safan had actually contacted the Yemeni station before he contacted Free, and the, and the Yemeni station came back and said they had none of this information. Well, I found out that right after uh, they had taken a photograph from Free of uh, Benetesh, that uh, was a passport photo. They'd given it to their joint source, and the joint source had positively identified this guy as Benatesh. The Yemeni station went to the CIA bin Laden unit and asked for two photographs, one of uh, Khalid al Midhar and one of Benatesh. And uh, the, on January 4th, Benatesh was positively identified by the, by the joint source, this guy in Pakistan, Islamic in Pakistan, who had been part of the al Qaeda terrorist. He positively identified Ben Tesh as a, a high-level terrorist who had been involved in the East Africa bombings, the coal bombing. And at that point, the CIA realized that they were criminally, criminally culpable in the coal bombing because they photographed all these people and let them walk away. And if Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had been at that meeting, which I think he was, there was a $2 million reward already on his head. But even besides that, all those people were al-Qaeda terrorists, identified as al-Qaeda terrorists. And... Uh, the investigation of the bombing, the East Africa bombing, was still ongoing. So the CIA had no legal right at all to withhold that information from the FBI. And now, I realize, here's one little confusing part, sorry to interrupt here, but the, the photo of Bin Atash, at any point, did was it Corsi or somebody was showing the photo to the FBI? They knew it was Bin Atash, but they were asking if it was Al Midar? No, there's a, there's a little tiny bit of confusion in there that, uh, that Fenton got confused about. And uh, unless you go back through it and, tr and separate it and figure out what had gone wrong, mm -hmm. at one point, Wilshire thinks that there had been a cable that identified Benetesh in a photograph with Midhar. So he gets three photographs of Midhar from the CIA. That was in mid-May. And he goes through them, and he's looking for Benetesh. Now, he, now what does that tell you? If he's looking for the picture, if he's looking to see if Benetesh was in the photographs of Midhar. What does that tell you? Two different people. Well, they're two different people, but but how did he know what Benatesh even looked like? Oh, he already knew Midhar, but he's looking for Benatesh. Sorry, okay. The only way he had he knew what Benatesh looked like was because of Ali Safan's request in April that he sent directly to the CIA that had Benatesh photographs, passport photograph attached to it. So that was the thing that keyed me on the whole thing, how I was able to put together the whole story. So then at that point, so, so Wilshire knows that the C that the FBI must have gotten some information about Benatesh and may even know about the call and court meeting, and because this was attached to his April request that he sent directly to him. So he looks to see if he can find Benatesh in these photographs of Midhar. Now, he had read this cable when it came in in January, but he must have forgotten it or misinterpreted it or, or somehow got confused in his memory because he thought that the cable said that Benatesh and Midhar were identified in the same photograph. It turns out that the Yemeni station who asked for these photographs asked for two photographs, one of Benatesh and one of Midhar. And these two photographs were then taken by the Yemeni station sent to the Pakistan station, which were given to the joint source, and the joint source identified Benatesh in the photograph on January 4th. Now, they didn't identify Midhar, but they didn't need to, because the CIA already knew that Midhar had been at the meeting. So now on January 4th, 
the CI knows that Midhar and Hazmi and Benetech are all connected to the plane of the Kobami. And that's what they were trying to keep secret. That was their, they were trying to keep, that was, the, that was the crown jewels. That's what led, actually that's what allowed the attacks on 9-11 to take place. The CI was so determined to keep that secret that they were willing to commit major felonies to keep that information secret. You can imagine that. And it was the fact that uh, Wilshire was looking at the photographs of Midhar trying to find Benetech. That's what keyed me off in the beginning. So then what does Wilshire do? He, sets, he gets those three photographs, gives them to Corsi, asks Corsi to set up this meeting, which he did. And then uh, Wilshire doesn't even trust Corsi. And it, it's small wonder, because it's even a wonder why Corsi worked for him. So, so uh, Lewis, or I mean, uh, what's his name? Michael Rowlands, the head of the ITUS, must have been involved in this huge conspiracy. Because there's no way Wilshire is going to come over in mid-May and then, of course, he's going to go to work for him, committing crimes, unless Roland said, oh, you're going to work for Wilshire, and you do everything he says. So, of course, he sets up this meeting. They go to the meeting. Of course, he hands out these three photographs. And then Shannon asks Bongard, do you recognize anybody in the photographs? And, of course, Bongard doesn't. But, but they were trying to figure out, had they found out about Midhar and Hosmi in their search for Benetesh? And uh, when I realized that, here's what happened. So instead of actually giving the information to Bongart like they should have, they set up a sting. The, the meeting in New York was a sting. So I actually called up uh, Bongart and I said, do you realize what the, why the meeting had been set up? He said, well, of course he set up. She didn't tell me what she wanted. I said, the meeting had been set up by Wilshire. They wanted to see if you could recognize Midhar and Hosmi. And he said, well, why is that? He said, because they were trying to hide the information on Midhar and Hosmi that they had been at the Quam board meeting planning the cold bombing. So that was just feeling it out to see if they could recognize them. Yes. Now, doesn't it all make sense at this point? Well, <laughs> there's a lot that makes sense, but there's a lot that's confusing still. Uh, Benetech had never been identified in any photograph of Midhar. That there was a small section in the nine or in the DOJIG report that said that Benton picked it up and put that in his book. But that was a mistake because later on, the same DOJIG report says that there had been two photographs: one of Midhar and one of Benetech. So obviously, who had ever wrote in the first part of the DOGIG report uh, somehow made a mistake, and nobody went back to reread the whole report to realize that the first part didn't agree with the second part. Now, here's what happened to me. I wrote that book, Prior Knowledge of 9-11, finished in November 2006, realized that it blamed the CIA on deliberate intentional murder of 3,000 people. Thought I was going to get my butt shot off by the CIA. So I called up this guy, Paul Thompson, and we got together in South San Francisco. So I sat there for several hours going over every point in detail that I could think of to make sure that he would put the thing out, that other people would write books, and I wouldn't be the only guy out there throwing rocks at the CIA. Right. And, and Isn't that the truth? Exactly. Well, why get your butt shot off? Well, that's the whole thing. Like, it, It's very interesting how you... Uh, spiral into this whole situation like oh, basically oh. you know it's uh, like i was reading on your website it's a prior knowledge of 9-11 which is the book you wrote it, it details how a businessman had become aware of the upcoming events of 9-11 in february of 2001 while on a business trip to new york and, and what was so amazing is i is i had put this together i put it together did i did you see what i i don't know if you've read the book but basically, there was one sentence in one magazine, and here's what the sentence is. It's the duty of every Muslim in the world to kill Americans, both military and civil, in whatever country they are found and destroy their possessions. When I read that sentence, I thought, oh, my God. First, My first reaction was, who the hell would put something like that out? That's just nuts. And then second, I had had this horrible experience in uh, Dusseldorf in June of 2000. I'd gone through the Dusseldorf train station flown into Frankfurt, took a train up to Dusseldorf. I was switching the train over to Hanover. As I'm walking through the Dusseldorf train station, there were five Arabs in the train station. They were obviously Middle Eastern students studying in Germany. And honest to God, when I went by them, they looked at me like they were literally going to murder me right in the goddamn train station. I never saw such mean, just downright, I'm going to kill you expressions. And I was so going back. The beginning of what you unraveled, was it kind of like, James Woods, who happened to be aboard a plane, and he says he saw terrorist training, uh, like, out of well, these guys training to hijack the planes for 9-11 or something? Like, something tipped you off 
while well, you that one trip, trip you, somehow that le- led you to realize all the stuff that was really going on? Well, here's what happened. I, when I read the sentence, I was going back to Dusseldorf in March. So it's February, right? That's one month out, right? Mm-hmm. I was going to fly into Frankfurt, take the train up to Dusseldorf, and then switch the train over to Hanover. And I thought, oh, my God, the, the terrorists that were in, those people that were in that train station in January or July of 2000, if they read that one sentence, and I met up with them again, I'm dead. And I said, I better look into this sentence. What, what like, sen- the sentence of what, sorry? It's The sentence is the fatwa. It's called a fatwa. Okay, a fatwa. When they put out a fatwa on a person to kill them or something. Yes, well, this this was to kill everybody in the United States, including civilians. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, they mean me. And and one of the things in the article, they said they had, uh, first it said Ben Laden had 20 training camps. And I said, oh, my God, that's kind of bizarre. So in February of 2001, you were already aware and suspicious of something going on with al-Qaeda or terrorism or the name Bin Laden or something like none of, when nine eleven uh, happened, this wasn't all foreign to you. Where it just came out of nowhere, who the hell is Bin Laden? What the hell is this thing called Al Qaeda? What are you talking about? Terrorism and stuff like this? Like it, well, this, well, here, here's, here's what I put most together. Most people, it just came out of the blue. Kind of, you know what? Here, I mean? Here's what I put together. That statement ultimately had to be a declaration of war against the United States. I couldn't figure out any other reason why they would have issued it. It was issued 10 years after the Al-Qaeda organization had started. The only reason for doing that was that, in my opinion, had to mean they were going to make a major increase in the level of their attacks, the the intensity. The only thing that I could think of beyond a 10,000-pound truck bomb against an embassy was an attack inside the United States. So at the very moment that I I went back to the press conference, after I'd analyzed bin Laden and his thinking and the religion and Islam and the rest of that, Mm -hmm. When I went back to the final analysis, I came to the conclusion that that statement had to mean the al-Qaeda terrorists were going to mount a gigantic terrorist attack inside the United States. So the next question is what? Well, what's the target? So I sat there for 30 minutes trying to figure out the target, gave up, decided I wasn't smart enough to figure that out, put this magazine down, picked up a travel brochure that was in the seat pocket right in front of me, and guess what's on the cover of the travel brochure? It was a picture taken of just above the Statue of Liberty, straight down on Manhattan. And, and, and when you see that photograph, those two fucking towers stand out like, like two sore thumbs. Mm-hmm. And I'd been looking for a target. I knew it was a huge target. It had to be to civilians, right? Mm-hmm. And it was three years from the airplane flight to the issued, when they issued the spot that the spot that was issued in February of 1998. So I knew it, they're not going to throw a goddamn grenade at a McDonald's in Cincinnati after three years. It has to be a huge target. It has to be civilians. It has to be extremely visible for the whole Amer- all of America because they want to give America a big slap in the face, right? Well, the attack on the coal uh, was preceded by an attack on, the, on a boat in the same location called the Sullivans in January of 2000. And, and when they tried to attack the coal, uh, the, the attack failed because the, the boat was so heavily loaded with explosives, it sank. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you once they attack a target and they miss, they never give up. And I knew they'd attack the World Trade Center in 1993, right? What does that tell you? They're going back after the World Trade Center. Can you imagine that? The whole breakdown when it comes to the intelligence failure. Well, there was no no. I actually, I was just going to correct myself. I was going to say it's not an intelligence failure because that's like the JRAF mantra, right, is like, it was a failure of imagination or whatever, or, you know, it, it just it happened and it was a failure. And then when you look back in hindsight, you think now that you know all this information, you might have been able to stop it. But no, when you really look at it, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, a failure of imagination or a failure of intelligence. It has everything to do with you knew what was going to happen and you didn't do anything about it, and you intentionally misled the FBI. What's worse than that, it's, it's, it's probably far worse than you could even imagine. When the when they, when Midhar and Hosni were found in the United States by Gillespie, Margaret Gillespie, in the bin Laden on uh, August 21st, on the 22nd, she took that information back to Corsi and Wilshire. Wilshire already knew that once they're in the U.S., they're here to take part in this huge attack. So what, Maggie Gillespie was the first one to realize that they were here? That they were in the United States for the second time. Uh, the CIA knew they were here in March 5th, 
Because the, the <laughs> official story, as far as we're supposed to know, right, was they had that meeting in Malaysia. Oh, oh, Al-Hidr oh. and Al-Hazmi, Aha, they board a plane and they go to America, and they're lost at that meeting. So they they end up coming to America, and just at that specific time when they come to America, all of a sudden the whole CIA intelligence apparatus breaks down and they lost them and they don't. Well, know they, they, they actually got the they got a cable which they made public, which is the March fifth cable that said uh, Housing has entered the United States in Los Angeles. But guess what? The CIA already knew that Midhar was in, in the same in the same airplane. How do we know that? Because the CIA. Uh, executive summary of the IG report says that CI knew that, that Hosni had come to the United States and that his travel companion had come to the United States. Didn't mention Hos, or didn't mention Bidhar. But uh, here's the, here's the thing: when they were leaving Kuala Lumpur, the CI gave the information on Khalid Al Midhar to the Thailand authorities because they knew he was flying to Thailand. So he was on a watch list in Thailand. When he, when the plane came into Thailand, they went back to the airplane and found that Narf was sitting right next to him on the airplane, looked at the passenger manifest and found out that Narf was really Narf El Hazmi. So even before they put Narf El Hazmi on the watch list, they had Midar on that watch list. Now, when the cable came into the CIA, it said only Hazmi. But, but the, the two had been watch listed in Thailand. So there's no way that the Thailandese hadn't given the CIA information that both Midar and Hazmi had taken off in the United States. Yeah, but isn't that where the CIA says that they lost track of them or something? Well, no. They lost track when they were in Bangkok. But when they flew into the United States, the CIA actually had a cable that said uh, the Thailand authorities have alerted us. That, oh, uh, they, they have sent a cable saying we have tracked them and they are in the United States right now. They, they, they went to the United States on, Mar- on uh, January 15th. And it only said Hosni. It looked, took Midhar's name completely off the cable when there's no way that the name could have been missing from the Thailand uh, watch list. So they're actually watch listed in Thailand. You can goddamn imagine that. Well, this is the thing. Yeah, known terrorists enter the United States. Yeah, but here's, what the, thi- here's the thing. Now, now, at this point, until the Cobalt took place, I didn't have any definite reason why they were hiding the name of Khalidah Midhar. The only thing I could think of is, is the CIA was either hiding their criminal culpability in the uh, East Africa mountains, which is probably highly likely, or the Midhar and Ali Mohammed had gotten together because the two of them were working on the uh, East Africa bombings. And the CIA didn't want anybody to find Midhar because it would have led right to Ali Mohammed. And Mohammed had already kind of disappeared inside the, the system somehow. He'd been arrested, never went to jail, had been deemed responsible for a large part of the East Africa bombings and then just vanished in the system. He must be in some kind of a witness protection program, as far as I can tell. And nobody wanted his name brought up because they were afraid if that got in the newspapers, well, then the CIA would look bad or the FBI would look bad because it would be exposing uh, the fact that they hadn't criminally prosecuted uh, El Midhar. But, but right from the get-go, right from the meeting, in fact, right from January there was a gigantic criminal conspiracy at the CIA to hide Midhar's name. And I was never able to find out exactly what the reason was. But, but in January 4, 2001, it was clear from that point on it was a criminal conspiracy to hide the CIA's criminal culpability and allowing the coal bombing to take place. Well, and, you, and you knew all this. You had a, a, a trail of all this information years ago. Yes, in, and now uh, we come to 2012, where we know, like, we had the whole Richard Blee uh, publicized and everything. In fact, I even had Blee's people, name on. But I had Blee's name on in about 2009. Oh, you had Blee's name. Well, we had. Was it George Tennant's book that named Blee? Well, George Tennant's book said Richard B. Nobody could figure out who Richard B. was. Oh, okay. In there was a handwritten note in the 9/11 files. Yes, where it said nobody anticipated what Al Qaeda would do except Clark, Black, and Blee, and yes, that supposedly that's the one where that Fenton me. finally <laughs> connected <laughs> Richard Blee to the Rich B from. Yeah, now, now here's amazing. Well, on the on the July 10th meeting at the White House, Blee, Black, and Tennant were there telling Hadley, Clark, and Rice about this huge attack about to take place inside the United States. So Clark clearly knew who Richard B. was. He knew it was Richard Blee. I don't know why people thought he, his name was so secret. And is that where he's talking about the slides and everything that would show, that would prove that uh, 
deeply informed other people or something. Like, as far as, from what I understand, okay, a lot of the uh, excuses and the apologists, such as, like, Jay Reffers or even, uh, uh, you know, Bob Baer will say, like, you know, oh, in order to have a conspiracy, uh, you know, it involves a lot of people, and, uh, you know, you just can't have that many people in the dark that wouldn't come out and talk. Well, this there revolves no around a very small group of people around Lee Alex Black Station. Lee again. Black and Tennant, and then Wilshire, and Wilshire was kept in the dark. And when the CIA thought, because of Stefan's request, that the, the FBI co-bombing investigators had found out about uh, Midher and Hosby, and they moved Wilshire over to the FBI, they didn't even tell him what he was supposed to do other than spy on the FBI criminal investigators. They told him that he had, they have to find out, he has to find out if they know about the meeting calling for and know that Midher and Hosby were in the meeting. They didn't tell him that he, his job was really to sabotage any effort by anybody to give information to the FBI criminal investigators on the co bombing about Midhar and Osby. But in July of 2001, when, when Wilshire makes two requests to the FBI, the first one said, Claude Ventesh is a major lead killer. We need to give this information to the FBI. Do I have permission to send it to the FBI? The CI refused to give him permission. That was July 13th. On July 23, he makes the same request. And in that request, he says, Midhar will be found at the point of the next big Al-Qaeda operation. Again, the CIA refused to give him the information, or the, the permission to give this information to the FBI. So, Blee, so uh, Wilshire's job, given to him by Blee, Black, and Tennant, was originally to just to find out what the FBI criminal investigators knew. And then in July, it was to make sure they didn't get the information on Midhar and Hosni under any circumstances. Well, what is this from Ali Soufan's book, The Black Banners? It says, I heard one of the SWAT agents asking, Ali, are you okay? He had seen me run into the bathroom and followed me in. I'm fine. I got myself to the sink, washed my mouth out, and splashed some water on my face. I covered my face with a paper towel for a few moments. I was still trying to process the fact that the information I had requested about major Al-Qaeda operatives, information the CIA had claimed they knew nothing about, had been in the agency's hand since January of 2000. The SWAT agent asked, What's wrong, bud? Why the hell did they, didn't he tell you? They knew. They knew, he said. Yep. Later on, FBI Special Agent Andrew Corey had been stationed elsewhere in the Middle East when the planes hit the towers. He was reassigned to join us in Yemen. And after he arrived and saw the files, he wanted to confront the blank. I held Andre back. They knew. Why didn't they tell us, Andre said. You're right, Ali Soufan said, and I'm just as angry, believe me. But now is not the time to ask questions. One day someone will ask the questions and find out. But right now we have to focus on the task at hand. So what's Ali Soufan talking about there? He knew that the CIA knew about Al-Midar and Al-Hanzmi, and they were hiding them from everybody. Well, not only that, but, but Soufan was sitting right next to the Pakistani lot on February 1st when Safan went back and, and gave the photograph he had that he got from the Yemeni authorities on Benetesh and asked the Alat, do you recognize this guy? And he re-identified him. Or he asked the, uh, the uh, German tourist if he knew this guy. And he said, yeah, I, I, I know he is. He's the, the, the uh, big rig in the al-Qaeda terrorists. The uh, CI, or the, you know, the CI, Pakistani Alat, was sitting right next to, to Safan knew that Benetech had been identified in the Kuala Lumpur photo just the month before, on January 4th, knew that the photograph had been taken at Kuala Lumpur, knew that they had also given him a photograph of, of Midhar, and the, the, the joint source didn't identify him, but he had all this information sitting right next to Safan, and he doesn't say a goddamn thing. Knowing that Safan was eminently interested in any meeting in Kuala Lumpur and totally interested in anything to do with Benetech, and uh, kept that information secret. The, 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 the Yemeni station who'd been asked originally kept the information secret, even though they sent back a request. And now it, it, what's amazing about that request, that request was obfuscated by the 9-11 Commission. It says, CIA's overseas personnel made a request to the Ben Laden with the photographs of Midhar and Hosni, or Midhar and Benetesh. It turns out, I found out that the CIA overseas uh, personnel were in the Yemeni station just after Benetech had been identified out of Safan's photograph in December. A lot of this revolves around the Yemen Communications Hub. Yes. And this was discovered by the NSA or the CIA as early as 1996? 
No, no. I th- somehow the FBI that... learns about it in '98 during the embassy uh, bombings when they found uh, the number in a guy's pocket or something like that. Well, remember the guy that was uh, well. One guy had a whole bunch of shrapnel on his back. What does that tell you? He was running like he a scared rabbit away from the bombing. Yeah. Yeah. So he had all the shrapnel on his back, and in the hospital, in his back pocket, they found the photo of the phone number in, in Yemen. Now maybe there's, there's somebody knew about it beforehand, but. And that's the only place that I could figure out where they found out that number. I don't know where. But at least at that time, they knew of the Yemen communications hub. That is like the main switchboard for Al Qaeda. Incoming and outgoing calls to Osama, to everybody calling in, to Khalid Al Midar's dad, to everybody. It was communication central for the East Africa bombing. So that everybody that had anything to do with that uh, number had to, something to do with the East Africa bombings. So when they let all these people walk away, they knew they were all connected to the East Africa bombings. So they yeah, know, they so they know they're they know they're connected to to the East Africa bombings. The NSA, the CIA are are monitoring this. Um, they know everything that's going on revolving around Al Qaeda. Yep. Uh, the FBI finally finds out about this, and then they get a uh, one way conversation thing going on or something. And in uh, what's his name's book there, Philip Sheenan's book. Uh, the history of the 9-11 Commission, he talks about how important the NSA files are dealing with this Yemen hub, and nobody's looked at them. Isn't that bizarre? That just means totally bizarre. And uh, But you can only imagine that if they had every communication incoming and outgoing from the Al-Qaeda switchboard, they must have known a hell of a lot. Oh, because, I mean, there's no way they didn't talk about the attack on the coal. That was nine months after the original meeting. There's no way they didn't talk about the, the planes operation, right? That must have been going on. Uh, and now, uh, both Safan and Clark had come out and said that this information was withheld from the FBI, from Safan, and from Clark. It turns out both of them said that because the cables that each of them got from the CIA had no mention of, of the Kuala Lumpur meeting, no mention of Benetech, no mention of uh, uh, Hosni, but all the cables that went back from the Yemen station, the uh, Pakistan station, the uh, CIA uh, Ben Laden, those cables that were going back and forth had the mention of the East Africa or the uh, Kuala Lumpur meeting, had mention of Benetech at the meeting, had mention of uh, Midhar at the meeting. In fact, when the Yemeni station asked for the photographs, it said, uh, please, to the, to the CIA Ben Laden, it said, please give us the photographs of Benetech and Midhar at the meeting. And the as far as I was, uh, I understand it through Mark Rosini or somebody somebody in his caliber, they described the Kuala Lumpur meeting as the who's who of terrorists. Yeah, I, I estimated, I mean, the main media came out and said there were 12 people there. Two of them were um, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and the other guy was uh, Ramzi Ben al Sheed, the two of the main planners of the uh, uh, 9-11 attack. So we have this, this meeting in Kuala Lumpur, we have, uh, I don't know if it was Francis or one of them saying, oh, well, the next attack's going to be in Malaysia. It's not going to be in America. Now, how stupid can you get? And I, I don't know if they said that after the fact or before the fact. But why would they, all, all these people left Malaysia? And why would they attack Malaysia? That's just stupid. So they, they track them to this meeting in Malaysia. They see. Yeah. They know that they disperse from Malaysia. They know that two of those people from Malaysia that were involved in the coal bombing entered the United States, and they're in the United States, but they fail to tell anybody about this. Or anybody who could have done anything. Or anybody that could have done anything. Yeah. And this all revolves around a very small group of people at Alex Station, which includes Michael Ann Casey, Alfredo Francis Bukowski. It has to do with uh, Barbara Mc. McNamara, I don't know if she's related to the McNamara that everybody knows. She was like the uh, the, the the ear behind the phones at the NSA. We have Tom Wilshire, Thomas Picard, Louis Free, um, Richard T. Black and Black Tenet. and Tennant. And now through that small and, and what I also found very interesting was when I was listening to Mark Rossini explain Alex Station. He said it was about fifty people around in cubicles and. Him and Doug Miller were the only guys there. The rest were girls. Yep. And I always thought it was interesting, not to be sexist or anything, but 
it seems to me that girls are more easily controllable than guys. They'll follow orders. A lot easier than guys will. Well, how could they move Wiltshire over to the become deputy chief of the ITOS unit, the FBI, and immediately he gets Corsi, and Corsi starts doing these criminal actions, setting up the meeting, knowing that the meeting is nothing more than a sting on Bongard and his team. And that's where they say, is, is she just acting on her own will, or is she, is she oh, no, she's directed by will. orders from other people? But how about Middleton, her boss? She got the photograph of Benetech taking a call for on August 30th. He'd been on the phone with, with Corsi on the 28th and the 29th of August telling Bongard he had to shut his investigation down. And then on the 29th, tell him that the, the lawyers had told him and Corsi that they had to shut the investigation down, which is all a lie because uh, the, uh, the attorney, I found her name was Sherry Sable, had told Corsi that since there was no NSA cable, Bongard could take part in any investigation they'd already cost me. And then we and have then, the 9-11 Commission come out, and then we have the Jersey Girls uh, check in. The 9-11 out. Commission was a fraud. It was but they, 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 they turned to footnote 44, right? Well, all that and was... And then that revolves around, this isn't a failure. This is intentional. It's deliberate. This is intentional. But here's the thing. The footnote 44 was about the original issues in January. What about the fact that when, when Corsi shuts Bongard down, first, were you aware that on August... 22nd. She already knows the CIA has the photograph of well I've been attached taking a call for. Already knows that that connects Midhar and Hosni to the planning of the coal bombing. Already knows that it's against the law for anybody to shut down Bongard because these two guys have taken part in a crime and that the withholding information on a criminal investigation is a crime. Already knows by withholding this information from Bongard she's committing a major felony. And this is Corsi. Corsi, are you aware that she knew on the 22nd of August that the uh, that the CIA had the photograph of Benetech and was hiding the photograph of Benetech from Bongard so he wouldn't have enough information to start any investigation with her and Hosmer? Are you aware of that? But what, I, I did not know that, but I'm asking is why would she do that? Is she just doing this out of her own free will? Oh, good. No, she, she was under the control of Wilshire. On the 22nd, she and Wilshire started putting together this EC. So Wilshire is, con- is, is, is handling Corsi. Oh yeah, he had her by the toes. He oh, had why? He, he, like a well because he's the guy that's being run by Blee Black and Tenet to make sure a the information on Midhar and Hosmer never gets to the co bomb investigators. Two that they start an intelligence investigation for Midhar and Hosmer to keep the investigation away from Bongard because they know that the FBI IOPR unit will never allow an investigation both an intelligence and a criminal investigation on the same target at the same time that they start an intelligence investigation. It's going to keep Bongard off any investigation of Midar and Osme. So they had to do that. And then just before the EC goes over to the FBI, Wilshire looks at it again and knows it says routine. And they put that NSA cable in there as an excuse so that Corsi could say, in fact, if the cable ever went accidentally to Bongard, that you're not allowed to look at the cable. On August 27th, the day before the cable goes over to the FBI, of course, he had already gotten approval to get the information on Midhar and Hosni and the meeting in Kuala Lumpur. He had gotten approval from the NSA to give the information on the Kuala Lumpur meeting to Bongard. She's not only committing crime, she's committing one crime after another. First, she knows that the CIA has this photograph of Benetech. Second, she knows she's got the approval from the NSA to give this information to Bongard. So when she says he's not allowed to have it because he doesn't have this approval, she already had the approval. Third, she lies about Sherry Sable's testimony. Sherry Sable on page 538, footnote 81, says that she told Corsi that since the information had no connection to any FISA warrant, that there was no restrictions on Bongard taking part in any investigation of Midar and Hosni, that he could have the NSA information, that the only reason that this information would be withheld from FBI criminal investigators is if it was connected to an FISA warrant, and then he could get permission if he got written permission from the NSA. He didn't need it. So now, all of a sudden, the hammer falls down on Corsi. Oh, she's a fucking murderer. She's a but murderer. We got to say, Middleton's a murderer. Corsi just conjure this whole thing up. No, no, she was in her own head for her own purposes without any. Think, think, think people don't do anything by themselves. They were under control of. They just follow them. orders. They do what they're told to do. Oh, they, they had to follow them. orders, or they were toast. But why isn't she questioning the orders that she's being told to follow? God only knows. Is it like what they say about compartmentalization? She doesn't know the whole picture. She thinks she's doing the right thing, but really she's 
she's being a useful idiot or something? No, she knew she was committing crimes. She knew she was committing one crime after another. Uh, I mean, look at this information that she knows that the that the the, uh, the CI is hiding the photograph of Benitez. You know where that's found? Page 301 of the DOJ IG report. Now, you would have had to read the report about five times to figure that one out because even when you read that one section, it's not entirely obvious until you go back and look at it and says, oh, my God. It says right here she knows that the CI is hiding the photograph of Benitez from the FBI. Oh, my God. You explicitly name Blee, Black, and Tenant, and I noticed that if we just follow Blee, Black, and Tenant, mm -hmm. let's take Tenant, okay, just get him out of the picture real, real quick. He, he'll just toe the line, whatever, whatever makes him, you know, whatever keeps his job, whatever makes him the director of CIA, whatever he has to do to keep his job, yeah, it, keep the it, prestige, etc. You know, I'll take the fall. I'll, I'll, I'll get blamed. I'll... I'll get a five million dollar contract for a book that I write, you know, and I'll go lie to the nine eleven commission. And everything can fall on my head, and I'll still get the medal of freedom. Oh well, that's a good deal. But then we oh. have someone say like Blee and Black. Now, if we trace their history back, well, we have Richard Blee's dad smuggled Stalin's daughter to the U.S. in nineteen sixty eight. Blee Richard ran the entire Middle East operation sector. He then goes on and he's tasked to destabilize Iraq and Tenant around the same time Tenant becomes deputy director. Clinton makes Tenant director. Tenant brings Richard to the seventh floor. Richard Blee and Black and those guys, according to this article, they were stationed in training in Africa around the Sudan at the same time Osama bin Laden goes to the he's chased out of the Sudan while he's being handled by Prince Turkey of the GID because Prince Turkey was head of GID mm -hmm. and he's basically Osama bin Laden's handler so he gets Osama to go to the Sudan coincidentally where Blee and Black are Blee's in charge of Alex Station at the time of 9-11. 9-11 happens, huge failure. And it seems like in the scheme of things and up the hierarchy of things, somewhere down the line, someone is told, shut your mouth about anything with Al-Qaeda. We don't want to hear it. We don't want it getting to the White House. We don't want to hear any of this. Uh, Clark claims that tenants briefing them and they're, he's calling them sev several times a day to talk about all this stuff. But the only thing he forgets to tell them is this information about Al-Midar and Al-Hazmi. Well, but it's even worse than that. He was getting cables, the raw cables from the CIA. Those cables were, were sabotaged. The, the cables that had the information on Midar and Al-Hazmi and the meeting of Kuala Lumpur only went inside the CIA. All the other cables were sanitized. They would have been sanitized by uh, Billy Black or probably by Tenet. And the same cables went to Safan. So Safan was getting the sanitized cables. That's why Safan and Clark came out and said it had to be tenant, or it had to be deliberate that they were hiding this information from him. Now, why they didn't come out 10 years ago and say that, I can't even imagine. Clark was in the 9-11 Commission. Why didn't you say the same thing in the 9-11 Commission? Well, you hear, the, you hear the whole story about how Clark used his testimony at the 9-11 Commission to uh, publicize his book. And I think so. He, he he tells his stuff, but uh, you know he didn't want to burn any bridges. He wanted to not burn any bridges and then make himself look good. But he could have come out and said, "Hey, look, right. these cables that came to me were all sanitized. Somebody was withholding. It had to be tenant." Right. He didn't want to burn any bridges. Right bridges. He didn't want to piss anybody off. Well, yeah. I mean, well, sort of. But he 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 told his story, and now you always hear how people say, "Oh, well, Clark's a total liar. He's a he's a he's a he's a he, you know he exaggerates. He, he's a bullshitter." basically. And uh, all the stuff he told about the whole thing when it comes to uh, who is Richard Blee and Secrecy Kills, he was just bullshitting, looking for another 10 minutes how, how in the people spotlight or whatever. Now, on JREF, I'm on there as a person called Palo Alto. <laughs> right. Oh, well, I kind of figured that, yeah. <laughs> My buddy, James E. 3100, who is really, yeah. really, like he's ex-military intelligence, and he... Yeah, I've talked to him before, yeah. He's he's so smart about this stuff, and he was, like I told you, he was the one who really helped me, and he had noticed that uh, post that you made, and you laid out the whole framework for this whole issue 
of the intelligence lies and the intelligence breakdown, and they just kind of like pissed on you, and they said, "Oh, yeah." yeah. Well, well, they do that, but, but you didn't have to realize. Treated you like a person that was trying to say that no plane hit the Pentagon, and then I seen that other post where you just made a few weeks ago, and you totally ripped them apart. And and they can't do any when when it comes to the information that you know about. Exactly. Exactly. Seth, make excuses and say, well, you can't really be looking in hindsight, and it's just a matter a matter of failure. No, it was. Oh, and also, also, also the Sabrina. Thing. She says, "I'm the only one that worked in intelligence. You people don't know jack shit about intelligence. You're idiots." Yeah. Well, I'm about to come back and blast her on that thing and say, "Well, you think everybody on JEREF is an idiot?" So, hello. So, so, so they were able to expose how a plane really did hit the Pentagon and, and the, the planes at the towers weren't holograms and the buildings weren't taken down by uh, super nano banana thermite oh, or whatever. Just, <laughs> I mean, all this stupid shit. I mean, if you look at JREF, 99% of it is just stupid. The only two posts on there, as I put a post on there about Masawi documents, and they couldn't do anything with that. They couldn't touch those Masawi documents because they're actually printed and they were in a court. They couldn't touch it. And, they, and are you aware that Masawi documents, when you put that together, it's, it, it, you can't really tell anything from the Masawi documents, but what it does, it completely confirms all the information I had from before. Well, that's what I was saying. I, I said to uh, Jim D., I'm like, how in the hell did this guy know all this stuff? Well, like I said, I put my book out in November 2006 called uh, Thompson and then had, and said, I want you to put this on, I want you to put Wilshire, I want you to put Corsi, I want you to put uh, Bongard, I want you to put uh, Safan on your time. Yeah, but uh, when it comes to your description of it, like, uh, again, like, how in the hell did you know all this? Well, like I say, I very carefully put it together and then contacted the FBI agents that were involved and then started asking them some questions. When I was asking question A, I was really getting an answer to question B. I'd just go in to, to see what I, one of the FBI agents, what I... But here's what I said. I said, remember when Corsi shut your investigation of Midhar and Osney down on August 28, 2001? He said, yes, I remember that. I have a pretty recollection of it. I said, were you aware at the time that she did that, that she admitted to the DOJIG investigators that she already knew that the CIA had the photograph of Benatesh taken in Kuala Lumpur, already knew that connected Midhar and Osney to the attacks, or the finding of the attacks on the coal, knew that that meant you should have an investigation and knew that she was committing a crime and she shut your investigation down. I said, Steve, were you aware of that? And uh, Steve says, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. So here's what Steve said. He first said, oh, my God. Then he said, Bob, where in the Christ's sake did you find that? And I said, Steve, that's on page 301 of the DOJIG report. I'll send it to you. And then I said, were you aware when uh, Gillespie found the fact that Midhar and Osmond were in the U.S. on August 22nd, took that information to Corsi and Wilshire? That Wilshire knew immediately they were in the U.S. to take part in a gigantic terrorist attack that would murder thousands of Americans. And he said, oh, my God. No, of course he thought they were in the U.S. to plan an attack in Malaysia, right? <laughs> of course, of course. And, and Steve said, Bob, where the hell did you find that? And I said, Steve, that's in DE-939, entered the Masawi trial on March 11, 2006. I'll send you a copy of that. Uh, I'll send you a copy of that uh, report. It was a defense exhibit entered in the Masawi trial. Can you imagine that? We got the Almidar Al Hazmi failure, mm -hmm. and that whole situation. We also have with Anthony Summers and Graham, and a couple of people have been talking about now about that Florida cell with the with the Al Haj and his family moving out of that house weeks bef just weeks before 9/11 happened. Okay, we got yeah, we able danger, it. able danger, which is also. Uh, I, I, I've just been learning. It's called Stratus Ivy or something, and there's a lot more to it than I initially thought. Um, See, where Jeff, that, that's all irrelevant. But what's relevant is that people in the U.S. knew that Midhar and Osmond were here to take part in a terrorist attack. Shut down Bongard's investigation, knowing that that when they did that. So that's 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 the holy grail of evidence, right that's there. That's the holy grail. Knowing that when they did that, millions, a thousand Americans were murdered, and they did it deliberately, and it involved Lee Black and Tennant. Now, how do I know it involved Lee Black and Tennant? Because the information that, that Gillespie brought back to the Bin Laden unit had to go, went to the State Department, to the FBI, and to the rest of the CIA. And there was no way that information in a cable could come out of that unit without being approved by police. Now, from Ken Silverstein's article in the uh, Harper's in January 2007, we find out that Glee and Black were very close. 
that meant anything that Blee knew would have gone to Black, and then Black and Tenet were close. So anything that Tenet or the Black knew would have gone to Tenet. And just how Clark thinks he was close with Tenet, but it never came to him. No, he was an idiot. And furthermore... Uh, but he's not. Okay, in the grand scheme of things, though, he's made to look like a bullshitting idiot, but he's really not. He's telling a lot of truth. No, right? he's not a bullshitting idiot. He was just kept out of the loop and was... But, but, but why he was so meek and didn't just demand to get answers... Is a wonder to me. Why didn't you just sit there? I mean, the, the, the CIA apparently had everybody wrapped up. So his whole theory about how they were keeping it from him because the only possible explanation he could think of was because he was the, the CIA was trying to recruit Almidar and Alhazmi as uh, double agents is just a retarded theory. Oh, it's just fucking bullshit. That, that doesn't hold any water, right? It doesn't hold anything. I, I didn't find one bit of information anywhere that they kind of recruit Almidar and Alhazmi did. So he's just trying to justify to himself, give himself some sort of well, why it could possibly be. He says he doesn't know why they withheld information from from right, uh, but he, but, he but he's he's thinking of the least the least. But, but, but what does that tell you? It tells you that he's never even looked at it. He never read the BOGIG report. Never read the 9/11 Commission report. He doesn't hasn't read anything. He's just trying to pick this out of the air. But he's just trying to minimize the damage, saying, I don't want to believe that there would actually be people that I worked with that were actually aware of this and let it happen. I have to admit to myself and fool myself into believing that the reason why that they were keeping this information about Al-Nidar and Al-Hazmi was because they were trying to recruit them as CIA agents. Well, why would they let a lot of stuff just happen to go wrong. Yeah, why would they let them carry out a gigantic terrorist attack? Then? That makes no sense. It's just the stupidity beyond belief. So anyway, in terms, in terms of Clark, he came out to Menlo Park in my town. He was there to sign a bunch of books. So I gave him 150, <laughs> I gave him 150 pages in a book I called the 9/11 Letters, which I'd given the 9/11 Commission, which were the summaries of all the FBI interviews I'd had. I'd gone to the, inter, the FBI eight times. They had sat me down eight times in private interviews, and I went over in detail and gave him a 30-page summary of how I'd figured it out. And that 150-page thing I'd given to the 9/11 Commission to Romer and to uh, Romer and to Kerry, Bob Kerry and Tim Romer, because mm-hmm. I thought they were the smartest. I also thought Richard Ben Vanista was smart too. But when I gave him my 150-page report of the FBI reports and said, "Do you have 30 seconds so I can give you an update what this says?" and said, "No, I don't. I got to leave." Turned around and left. Like so. Anyway, so what I did is I gave this uh, book to the 9/11 Commission, 150 pages, all these FBI reports. And then the Romer came over and said, well, Bob, how the hell do you know it was the World Trade Center? And, of course, I had explained that it wasn't, I didn't know. I just accidentally saw that picture. There's a lot of documentation where supposedly, I haven't seen the actual documentation, but like you had said, they knew the targets that day. That's how they knew where, they knew where the Shanksville plane was supposed to go because they knew the targets that day before it happened. Let me tell you how they knew the targets. On June 12, 2001, they were told that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was actually the guy directing these terrorists, that he was sending more terrorists in the United States in the summer of 2000, and one blink up with other terrorists who were already here, to take part in this attack. Now, the CIA had already been given the information from Colonel Mendoza in the Philippines that Murad, Abdul Murad, when they sat down and talked to him, he told him that the next plan Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was coming up with was to hijack airplanes in the United States, hit the, uh, the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, the Congress, and the CIA headquarters with these airplanes. Now, when, when that information in June 12th came in, according to Colfer Black, he said, well, the CIA didn't know it because it went to the renditions unit, and it got pigeonholed in the renditions unit. Guess who ran the renditions unit? Richard oh, Lee. Richard Lee. Can you goddamn imagine that? When Ken Silverstein wrote his article, he said, this guy James, he said it was against the law to give his name, and everybody already knew his name. <laughs> it was against the law to give his name was running the renditions unit, and he was a good friend of black. So when that information came in on the uh, police Sheikh Mohammed was running this attack, they knew immediately the targets were the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, the Congress, but perhaps the CIA headquarters would be doubtful, and uh, they were going to use hijacked airplanes. And that information went right from blee to black right up to Tenet. So when uh, Tenet went out to the White House, he already knew what the targets were. He knew what the plan was. Well, yeah, it's just uh, a little. Again, all, these, all this information is interesting. It's just kind of. It was, it's it's just a little. Of, so anyway, the, the woman that was in charge of the uh, Joint Inquiry Committee of the House. Well, first, the, I talked to both uh, Michael Jacobson and to uh, Rick Sinning here. He, he was the guy that was running the 
Joint Quarry Committee of the House and Senate for a while until Eleanor Hale took over. And he sent me a letter and said, Bob, we agree with the FBI because the FBI told me I was not responsible for the attacks on 9-11. We agree with the FBI that you should not feel that you are responsible for the attacks on 9-11, that the FBI had as much information as I had. That was from the guy that was second command to Eleanor Hill on the Joint Quarry Committee of the House and Senate. Well, I, as far as I understand it, Eleanor Hill did an excellent job. But she did an excellent job. So I called her on the phone and said, Eleanor, uh, were you aware that uh, at the time that uh, Midhart House were found inside the United States, were you aware that the CIA knew that they were here to take part in the shoot attack? And said, oh, we knew that. We just knew that they were not talking to the FBI. And I said, well, it's a little bit more than that. They knew that they were here to take part in the shoot attack, and they deliberately withheld this information from the FBI criminal investigators. Are you aware of that? And she says, well, I think we put that in our book. And I said, I, didn't, I couldn't find that anywhere. Well, when Jim D. talked to her, she kept referring him to uh, to Graham's book, Intelligence Matters. And she said, I'm not allowed to tell you. I, I can't tell you specific things because it's classified, and by law I can't tell you. But if you read Intelligence Matters, I think Bob basically makes it pretty explicit in there what happened. Well, here's what I said. Are you aware of the July 23 uh, email that Wilshire sent to his bosses, Lee Black and Tennant, that said Midhar will be found at the point of the next big al attack? And I said, are you aware of that one letter? She says she's not sure, but then she says... That oh, means, who sent the letter, sorry? Uh, Wilshire, on the July 23, sent a letter to Lee Black and Tennant that said Midhar will be found at the point of the next big al operation. Wilshire sent a letter to Blee, Black, and Tennant pointing Midhar, Al Midhar as one of the people involved in the next terrorist attack. Yes. And this was when? July 23. That's the... So two months tonight. before... Yes. Wow. And I said, are you aware of that letter? And she says, she's not sure what the date is. And then she says, oh, my God, are you tell me the people inside the U.S. government knew that the terrorists were going to take part in a huge attack? I said, that's exactly what I've been trying to tell you. And then she says, oh, my God, you're trying to tell me that the people in the U.S. government knew that the terrorists who were in the U.S. and they going to take part in the shoot attack. I said, I have the letter. I'm asking you, do you have the letter? And she said, uh, you know, you should give this to the U.S. attorney. You know, by the way, I made for me. I've got to hang up now. Goodbye. But, no, because when it comes to Eleanor Hill, like, I mean, she did a lot of the, foot, the, 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 the legwork when it comes to the intelligence inquiry, and the intelligence inquiry is the main reason that we have this connection with al and al hazmi She hid the information on the July 23 email. She hid the fact that the CIA knew that Midhar and Hazmi were going to take part in the shoot attack. She hid the information that the information went to Blee, Black, and Tenet, that they were in the U.S. She had the information that Tenet flew down to the White House on the 24th of August. So she had, so she had a lot of information that was, should have been critical. She had the information on Sapan. Sapan just kind of vanishes. The fact that Sapan had asked the, the Yemeni station when they knew that they were uh, taking part, that they had, knew there had been a meeting, they knew Ben Atesh had been part of it. She had the fact that Louis Free knew this and that he criminally sabotaged Sapan's investigation. Uh, Safan is just missing out of the Joint Inquiry Committee of the House and the Senate's report. He's just gone. So he was he he never testified in closed doors to the Intelligence Inquiry or the Commission. He Alex testified Sifan? twice to the 9/11 Commission, and yet he has just literally been excised out of the 9/11 Commission report. The reason is that if you knew about Safan, then you knew the CIA had committed crimes. Once the, that came out in the 9-11 hearings that they had committed crimes, it was going to have to go to court. You see, I didn't want anything to go to court. So why isn't Sufan being more vocal about this? Like, I mean, he's on, God six, only knows. He's on 60 Minutes and everything. You know, he'll talk you know, and, basically, and stuff. He'll go on John Stewart and stuff. He'll do, he just did a Q&A in the New York, uh, the New Yorker, well, the New York Times or whatever. But, well, can you imagine this? He knows that they had deliberately withheld the information. Now, that's a crime from him and, and the other FBI agent. That's a crime. But why hasn't Safan put it all together? Why doesn't he say three have committed a crime that this information that clearly was withheld by Tenet Black and Biddy and even the, the latest interviews when he, when he says all this? So do you think that, Sufan's along, he, he, he's, he's towing, the, not towing the line, but he's, he's, he's falling in line with the official story because he knows if he goes against it, he can't win, but if he kind of just doesn't rock the boat, he can have his nice little uh, 
the Susana group. He, he, he can have his nice little uh, uh, consultation yeah. group and get <laughs> millions of dollars in uh, investment. Hello. And have a nice life and shit like that. Yeah, hello. Because that's what it seems like with all of them. Is like they'll tell you a little bit of it, but they and they, they, they draw that. a line at a certain point. When and if anything points at inside knowledge, it that line's drawn. But I mean, right. how, how can how can Graham in his book Intelligence Matters on page one sixty six he see, uh, I, I know this quote off by heart it says uh, we were seeing in writing what we suspected for a long time the White House was directing the cover up well they were directing the cover up yeah well I mean that's that's right there that quote right there I mean it's not out of context it says the White House was directing the cover up. Bob Graham well, says it, that. After it happened, they totally covered it up. They, they first, they first uh, stacked the deck. They, they said you can't get a subpoena unless you have six people. Then they put five Republicans on the 9-11 Commission so they could never get six to get a subpoena. And, uh, I mean, you get five Democrats, but no Republican was ever going to get a subpoena. Well, that's what I also asked Jim D. Uh, because we have Bob Graham that speaks out against it. We have that Kerry guy that spoke out against it. We have uh, Senator Lehman, I think it was, in... Uh, What's his name's book, The Commission? Uh, New York Times writer. What am, who am I thinking of here? Well, Phil Sheen. Sheenan's book, where he says they he says they dodged the questions about Saudi Arabia when Cheney and uh, and Bush were being questioned. But like I said, I guess, Saudi Arabia. Uh, ben Venista wrote in his. I never read his book, but supposedly he wrote in his book some exchange about the questioning with Bush and uh, Cheney, but none of these people will go to the length, even with like Lawrence Wright. He was the one who first started this whole thing about, he, well, sir, he opened yeah. the floodgates basically yeah. about certain aspects with the FBI and Wilshire and the FBI not wanting to be um, blamed for, for their incompetence for this and stuff like that. Then we have Anthony Summers that goes to a certain extent and he'll, He'll expose the Saudi Arabia connections and stuff, but he won't expose that it was known uh, through the CIA and intelligence agencies what was going to happen, how it was directed and everything like that. Uh, we also have, like, uh, McDermott, Terry McDermott, you know, all these people, but they don't go far enough. They definitely don't go far enough. Now, now if you can imagine it, so, so um, Benton ends up with my book. And then in, in, in his book, and he, and he actually took most of his book from my book, he says he doesn't believe that uh, the Black and Tennant were involved. He believes that Lee was involved, and he was acting on his own. Well, that's just bullshit. When you, when you finally know about the CIA, you know that nobody did anything without Tennant's approval. Then that book went to, uh, I think it's Summers, the 11th day. Yeah. So they took the information out of Tennant's book, and they said, well, they don't believe that the CIA acted uh, in the various ways, which is bullshit. Because uh, the CIA is the guy that put the Wilshire over into the ITOS unit to spy on the FBI and then sabotage their investigation. Are you aware that Wilshire actually made contact with Malty, Michael Malty? No. Uh, Dave Fresk and Michael Malty were the two guys who were sabotaging Harry Salmon's investigation of Masali. On August 24th, Malty makes contact with, with uh, I mean, uh, what's his name? Wilshire makes contact with Malty and finds out that somebody is sabotaging Salmon's investigation of Masali. And does that have anything to do with Robert Wright Jr.? Nope, it has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with somebody in the I2S unit you know, was sabotaging Samet's investigation. Now, it may not have been, um, may not have been Wilshire, but it could have been Wilshire. Uh, Maltby didn't know it was Wilshire because he was talking to Wilshire as if he didn't know what Wilshire was, who he was, just that he was another guy in the I2S unit. You know. But it's crystal clear that at the same time Wilshire is sabotaging the investigation of Adar and Hosmi. Wilshire knows that somebody is sabotaging the investigation of, Mid of uh, Masawi on August 24th. So at that point, he has all the information he needs. He knows Masawi is a terrorist trying to train on a big airplane. He knows that Midhar and Hosmi are in the U.S. to take part in a huge terrorist attack. He has everything. And he himself is sabotaging the investigation of Midhar and Hosmi. Hello. After the 9-11 attacks happened, but you know, the main crux of it was that they had the main characters and the main actors involved. You know how they found you know, the They just happen to go, the first flight school they go to just happens to be one of the flight schools. 
it just happens to be one of the flight schools that was training terrorists. Like they just happen to be such a have such great investigative skills after 9/11, but they were you know how, how, cards before 9/11. <laughs> you know how they found uh, all the terrorists? They found the receipt that when they were finally able to get a search warrant, they got the search warrant on the afternoon of the uh, September 11th. Went into Masawi's duffel bag. There was a receipt for Ramsey Ben El Sheed. Went over to Germany, talked uh, to the German uh, in the intelligence unit, found out that one of the terrorists had gotten a phone call from you know, from the UAE. The phone call was from the paymaster. Went down to the phone records of the paymaster in the, in the UAE, and that pinpointed all the terrorists who were, uh, took part in that attack. So they linked him to the uh, Al Qaeda terrorists in Hamburg. They found the, the recruiter, Mohammed uh, Zammer, the al-Qaeda recruiter, found that Marwan al had been in contact with the uh, paymaster, found the paymaster had been in contact with at least uh, most of the terrorists, if not all of the terrorists, and had given them money and yada, yada, et cetera. Do you, think, do you think any of them ever called the Yemen hub at all in two years? Or? <laughs> I, God only knows. But, yeah, the, the, the FBI was the one that gave them the Yemen hub's number. If you can imagine that. And then the CI doesn't give the information back after they got the number of the Yemen hub. No, the whole thing is kind of strange. But like I say, when I was in 9-11 hearings and I heard George Santa lie through his teeth. Well, I thought, yeah, that was hilarious. Well, not hilarious, but disgusting in a way when uh, Jim D first sent me that uh, clip where he's talking with Romer, was questioning him. He's like, Listen to George's answer and look at the long pause. Even Romer knows he's lying when he's saying he didn't. Oh, and everyone knew he was lying. So the 9 11 hearings were just a kangaroo court. Well, let's go in there and prove to the American people that the CIA didn't deliberately allow this to happen. We just come up with a total kangaroo court. Tenet apparently could say anything, even nonsense. Oh, yeah. Well, even like I, I talked to Lee Hamilton. He said, We were not looking to place blame on anybody. We were there to tell the story. Tell the story yeah. of 9 11 but not to place blame on anyone. Yeah, but just recently in that interview, the, you know, the Secrecy Kills interview, it says that uh, Hamilton, or no, Keene, says that we were lied to by Tenet. Tenet deliberately withheld information from Midhar and Hazen from the FBI and lied to us, deliberately lied to us. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a misstep. Yeah, it wasn't a misspeak. It wasn't a unintended. Out, out, it was an, an outright lie. lie. And that is where... I cannot understand how to... Uh... How, how did these people get away with these goddamn lies? So I called this guy, Scott Shane, at the New York Times. And I talked to him before, and I gave him the whole story on the Midhar and Hosman. You know what he finally said? So Scott Shane said, you know, we should have had a full story on Midhar and Hosman. This was just right around the, the last anniversary of 9-11. You know, we really should have had a, a story on 9-11. Now it's a little late, so I don't think we can put it in the paper. Uh there's not like, an audience for it. Nobody wants to hear about uh, it. After the anniversary, uh, it might, if, you, if I'd gotten to him maybe three months before the the uh, anniversary. But, you know, I talked to him after I read the article by these by Duffy and this other guy. And uh, so I, I, I didn't get to him until maybe the end of August, first part of September. So at that point, maybe it was a little late to write an article. I think I'm going to call him at the, sometime in June and say, now's a good time to put an article on Midhar and Hosni, and I'll give you all the... Because I think I've got all the facts as much as anybody. I mean, I may have some of the details not down, but the details I don't have down, I consider to be irrelevant. The, the key is, uh, Tenet, Black and Blee knew there was a huge attack, knew that Midhar and Hosni were in the U.S., even knew what the targets were. Okay, when, so if, if you're right and Tenet, Black and Blee knew all the details, yes, Tenet deliberately withheld the details from Clark. Well, he didn't withheld the details from Clark. He just he just kind of left them out of the cables that Clark was getting. They could have filled Clark in on the details, and then left obviously didn't verbally give him the details. But when Clark's saying uh, George was calling me seven times a day and he was discussing everything with me, and he discussed everything with me except this one thing, it had to be a conscious decision not to talk to him about that one thing about Al Hazmi and Al Al Midar. Well, absolutely, because, again, they were afraid that they would be found culpable, criminally culpable in the coal bombing. That's the last thing they wanted, right? They did not want to be found criminally culpable. Tenet would have been out of a job. The whole agency would have had to gone through a, a congressional review. They would have ripped that place into shreds, and they would have realized that the thing had become a gargantuan criminal enterprise for put together for no other reason than just to protect the 
FBI from crimes that they committed in the past. Well, what about the whole situation where Michael Ann Casey mm-hmm. says she stopped Doug Miller from sending out the information? Yes. She goes and says that the information was later, then later sent. Francis Bukowski later testifies to the commission that she went down to FBI headquarters and gave them the information herself, but they have no record of her ever being there. So she's lying for Michael, who is lying for whoever she's taking orders from. Which she's she's taking orders from Wilshire. She's taking orders from Wilshire, who's taking orders from then Blee? Yes. And so Blee is like, this all revolves around... This is Blee, like Black, is Richard Blee is the ma- mastermind, and he no no Blee Black and Tennant. It was like I say, this gigantic conspiracy to keep secrets away from the American public to protect the CIA. And the secrets got bigger and bigger, and the conspiracy got more and more. Once they realized they had committed criminal acts to hide this information, from the FBI, they sure shit couldn't let Bongard continue with his investigation mid Arm House, and that's why, of course, he had to shut his investigation down. They knew that if, if, if Bongard continued with his investigation. And found the information that the photograph of uh, Benatesh had been at the CIA. Bunger would have realized that the June 11th meeting at New York headquarters was a sting, a criminal sting on the FBI and his group. Half of the CIA would have gone to prison. At least the management would have gone to prison. 50 to 60 people knew about Midhart Hosni and the, the CIA. All those people would have gone to prison. They're trying to keep themselves out of prison. But why did they get themselves in that situation in the first place? What was well, their, like say, what was were, their all, ultimate uh Their goal? ultimate thing was to hide information on Midhar, and I never could find the reason for that, other than maybe they had been culpable in the uh, East Africa. Bombing. So they wanted 9-11 to happen to create a big war on terrorism no, no, where no, the no. military-industrial complex thrives? No no, 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 no. I don't believe that the low-level people, of course, Middleton. Black, uh, Lee, Tennant? No, no, no. Middleton, Wilshire. Corsi and uh, those people, I don't believe that they actually wanted 9-11 to happen. They just couldn't see any way that they could give the information to the FBI. And uh, even though they knew this attack was going to come, they said, well, we got to go with making sure this information doesn't get to the FBI criminal investigators. So we have, the first thing we have is the joint inquiry yep. in, in 2002, and, they, and that brings out the 28 classified pages. Now, were you were you aware that both Bongard and the Wilshire were in the, the September 20th, 2002, Joint Inquiry Committee public hearing? They were the two CIA agents that were hidden. No, there was a CIA. Or, or they, they, they testified, but they were their faces weren't shown or whatever. Yeah, that was Wilshire and Bongard. That was Wilshire and Bongard. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I I have it all on uh, I have it all on video. And I always wonder who those that? two guys were. That's Wilshire That's and Bungard. Dear old Wilshire and Steve Bungard. And Bungard starts to say things, and then Wilshire says, oh, you can't say that. That's classified. We can't say that. Keep your mouth shut. That's classified. Yeah, he oh, starts to interrupting Bungard or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Now, also at that meeting was, was Rollins. So Rollins was there, and I had a, a, a terrible experience. I was about to tell Steve that uh, I think Rollins was a big skunk. And so I, before I did that, I said, well, what did you think of uh, dear old Michael Rollins? He says, oh, well, Roll and I, when we did blah, blah, blah. Anyway, when he used the word Roll, I said, oh, shit. This guy has somehow gotten in good with the Rollins. And, and he mentioned the word Roll, meaning that he knew Rollins. He knew he was a, somehow a friend. And uh, he wasn't going to say anything bad about him. So then at that point, I had to shut my mouth. The same thing with Lawrence. It's right when I talked to Steve about uh, how did I get all this information. And he said, well... Lawrence and I sat down for, for almost a day. And when he said Lawrence, you know, when somebody says somebody's name, you can either tell they like the guy or they don't like him. Right. Because obviously he liked Lawrence, and I said right then there to my mind, to myself, well, this guy Lawrence has gotten in good with Bongard and knows every goddamn detail. And uh, that's how he got all these goddamn details. He sat there for uh, at least a day interviewing Gerald. But that's what the J. Raffers, they hold Lawrence Wright's book on a pedestal. And they say, well, well, that's what you can use against him. So here's what Lawrence Wright said. He said they criminally obstructed the investigation, very criminally withheld this information from but the I, 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 That's how I went about my case. 
the J reference say, well, Lawrence Wright is proof enough that it was incompetence and in just a bunch of failures, and it I wasn't. Never, you know, Lawrence Wright never said that. He said it was they was deliberate. They, they use they use the looming tower as it was just failure. Yeah, you the imagination. You need to quote the looming tower. You also need to go back to the Masawi documents, which clearly show that it was criminal. Law. Actions that withheld this information. Well, we have okay. So we have the joint inquiry in 2002. It it brings out it brings about the classified 28 pages that has to do with foreign financing, Saudi Arabia, Omar Al Bayoumi, Osama Bassan, uh, Al Midar Al Hazmi, uh, Abu Stader Sheikh, and Stephen Butler, the FBI agent who was the handler of Abu Stader Sheikh, who had two who had Al Midar and Al Hazmi living at his house. All that whole situation that Eleanor Hill is delving into and stuff like that. So you're trying to tell me that she finds all this stuff out and then she never finds any problem with it. Then we have the, two, the 2007 uh, CIA Inspector General's report, which yeah. we get a classified version of. And then we get the DOJIG report, which you refer to a lot. Well, that's the that's the Justice Department Inspector General's report. That came out in 2004, redacted, and then came out in 2006, unredacted. Okay, and then the, and then the last thing after that is the 9/11 Commission report. Oh, then the CIA uh, executive summary of the CIA Inspector General's report. And that was just a an unclassified variant. Well, the executive too. summary was unclassified. The actual report is classified, and that's one that clearly points to tenant black and blue is. Criminals. I'm sure it points to them as criminals. But and which one does that? The CIA uh, Inspector, Inspector General's, General's report. That is never going to be released because it points out that blue, black, and tenant. So we have the classified version. Yeah, and I took the classified or the unclassified version in 2007. We haven't had anything beyond that. Well, we've never had an unclassified CIA report. We've and that was something to do with. Uh, with that went through the whole thing and named people at the CIA had. Criminally withheld this information from the FBI. Right. Well, we had we had Bob Graham as co-chair, and what's the name of the other guy there? Well, what's amazing to me is how come all these guys are, are a limited hangout? Why didn't they put the whole thing together, right? And it wasn't that hard. I, I but what's the Republican guy's name that was CIA on the other side? There was. Porter Goss. He's the one who said he's the one who classified the Inspector General's report, yeah, right? Because he, he said it puts blame on people, and we don't want to well, be blaming it's people. To, it's going to besmirch uh, the. America's finest, America's finest mass murderers. That's what we're so <laughs> Okay, so we have all that. So, but we've talked about was Al Midar and Al Hazmi was the San Diego cell. They were living with Abu Stader Sheikh. They yep. were the ones on board Flight 77. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in 9/11 conspiracy theory, I have to bring this up. A lot of a lot of conspiracy theorists believe that no plane hit the Pentagon, but in reality, it's not a question of whether a plane hit the Pentagon or not. It's why did the plane hit the Pentagon in the first place, especially with all we knew about Al-Midar and Al-Hazmi. That's just stupid. It's utterly stupid. It is beyond belief. It's just stupid beyond anything that you can imagine. And that's what that Stephen Butler guy, too, who is the uh, FBI counterterrorism agent, he said... That if the CIA would have gave, if they would, if he would have known about the information, he could have at least, at least stopped the Pentagon plane. Well, he he would have just known that information. They, because if they had their their credit cards, ten of the tickets were bought with the Mid Iron Hosmi's credit card uh, credit card. Yeah, and as Jim D also uh, chronologically pointed out, after all the plane tickets were bought. Those people in Florida that Anthony Summers and Bob Graham just exposed this past anniversary in the gated community there, that Al Haj guy, him and his family beat the scene and they left. They left. Like Florida I think those are all known players. But the big thing is our intelligence community deliberately allowed these attacks to take place just to keep themselves out of prison, and it's been all covered up. Now, now imagine the cover up. Where did I mean? We know that the. Uh, the information went to the CIA. Uh, this was the Wilshire's cable on the fact that Midar was going to be taking part in these attacks. But we don't have an exact record exactly who it went to. We don't know exactly where the information that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was going to take part in this attack. We don't we know it went to believe, but we don't know where else it went to. We can assume it went to Tenet and Black. Uh, we don't know what uh, where uh, what Tenet actually knew. We can kind of guess what he knew when we threw down the Crawford. We don't know what he told the president. Once you realize that the Yemen station, the Pakistan station, and the Bin Laden were all involved, 
you know at that point the only guy that the, the, the common denominator is tenant. When you realize all these cables had all that information stripped out, you knew that the only guy was Tennant. Uh, Fenton, uh, the problem with Fenton is he was relying on the timeline. And the timeline has a huge amount of information, but it doesn't come to any conclusions. Once you have all this information, you, you just can't, unless you've actually sat down and analyzed it. And then, Well, that's what like, uh, Paul Thompson said about the timeline. He's like, you know, you have all these little bits and pieces here and there, but no one's ever bothered to put everything together. So that's what I did. I put it all together, and the reason is because once you have a conclusion, now you can go back and forth and find more information. Instead of having billions of extraneous pieces of information, you can now start putting it together. And then you have that information, you come to more conclusions, and then as you're going down this chain of conclusions, you can now put a nice coherent account together, which I did in this prior knowledge. I also have another book called uh, Countdown to the Attacks on 9-11, which is just takes all my information out on how I found out about the attack. Well, what's your conclusion, though? What's your... The bottom line of your conclusion that you've figured out. Billy Black and Tennant had deliberately allowed the attacks to take place to keep themselves out of prison, that they had involved the, both the FBI director of the FBI's unit, the, the section, and the ITOS unit, that Rowlands had to be involved, the uh, Malti and Fresco were involved. Uh, so, okay, let's let's take Blee, Black, and Tennant. Yes. Blee, Black, and Tennant enabled 9-11. They deliberately without information from the FBI. Why? And then they uh, then they allowed the attacks to take place because they didn't want to be found criminal and culpable in the coal bombing. And by the time the, uh, they knew the Midhart and Housing was in the U.S., they had already taken part in many criminal actions. But it has, so you're, it has nothing to do with pressure from above or anything like that? Well, we don't know that with respect to Tenet because he flew out to the White House, so it could have been... Uh, George told him to look at it. Well, here's 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 what uh, one thing I'm thinking. Uh, Bush was not an idiot. No. Bush is portrayed as an idiot. He pretends to be an idiot. He pretends to be an idiot, and he's portrayed as an idiot in Fahrenheit 9/11. What an idiot! Okay, but Bush knew a hell of a lot. Well, then he Bush had... was getting information from Blee Black Tenant or whoever. Well, I think Blue but Black he was Tenet also Tenet getting Tenet. information from Prince Bandar, his well, buddy, Prince Bandar, Bandar Bush, the one who said that he was tracking the terrorists with precision. Well, can you imagine this? He got information from Rice on July 10th when when uh, when the Blue Black and Tenet went over to the White House. Rice immediately went to Bush and told him, these guys think there's a huge attack going to take place inside the United States. And wasn't there some kind of situation where it was well known in circles of Washington that the White House didn't want to hear anything about Al Qaeda? Didn't somebody well, say, was it Ashcroft or somebody that said, you know, I don't want to hear about that? Shut, shut, shut up about that. I don't want to hear about it. That was Ashcroft. Ashcroft is kind of a weird guy. He had told, uh, uh, what's this guy? That's uh, Ben Venista. Ben Venista. Ashcroft and uh, Phil Zelko got and had a meeting with Tennant, and uh, Tennant said that he, that uh, that there had been a meeting at the White House that he'd given this information to Rice, Clark, and Hadley. Stephen Hadley. And uh, and then immediately uh, Rice said, "Well, I don't know what to do. Why don't you talk to uh, Ashcroft?" Now that was on July 10th. On Ju- uh, so then. Rice didn't know what to do, so she said, tell, give this information to um, Rumsfeld and to Ashcroft. Ashcroft's in charge of the FBI. So on the 17th, um, Billy Black and Tennant go over and talk to Ashcroft and to Rumsfeld and say there was a big attack inside the United States. We need to do something. And Ashcroft then quits flying on commercial airplanes on the 26th. And when the news people ask Ashcroft, well, what the hell is going on? He said, well, I, I've been told by the FBI that there's some unspecified threat. I can't tell you what it is, but I'm not going to fly on commercial airplanes anymore. And I was in the 9-11 hearings when uh, when somebody, I think it was well, Ben Vanista, asked him that question. Why did you quit flying on commercial airplanes? And Ashcroft said, well, I didn't. I actually took vacations on commercial airplanes. And, <laughs> yeah, don't think of that. So he's asking a question, why did you quit taking airplanes, which he clearly did. And he said, well, I took personal trips on uh, commercial airplanes. So he, he answers a completely different question. And Ben Vanista knows the guy is lying, knows the guy had gotten the warning on uh, on July 17th about this huge attack. Knows that he doesn't want to say anything about that. Uh, uh, this fact he's gotten warning, but and nobody even finds out until we get uh, Bob Woodward's book. 
it says that there had been a meeting and that they had talked to both Ashcroft and Rumsfeld also. But Venista doesn't want to rock the boat. And Ben Venista keeps his mouth shut in the 9-11 hearings. And he knew when Ashcroft answered his question, he was lying. But that's with all of them. They don't want to rock the boat. Like Lee Hamilton said, we were set out to tell the story of 9-11, and we didn't want to place blame on anybody. So the hope with my book was that people would pick it up, read it, and then continue on and add more and more meat to the book or do more interviews or whatever. And to try to get the, I mean, this where they had bombs in the buildings and I don't know if they're my nose bullshit. It was such a bunch of horseshit. That may have been horseshit started by the CIA to hide their culpability. So people, well, yeah, it seems like a lot, out. all, all a lot of the conspiracy theories are there to hide the real factors. So the CIA had been involved, and then they, the CIA can come back and say, "Oh, these people are just a bunch of kooks." You don't want to believe that horseshit. And then these uh, 9-11 truthers have gotten so and so angry and so nasty that <laughs> nobody wants to hear anything about them. I mean, look at JREF, right? Well, well, you put something nine, in there that's intelligent, then they come back and say, oh, that's just, just garbage. You don't know what 9-11 truthers are the joke of the world right now. They are, like, I mean, at this point. If you're a 9-11 truther, like... You're a joke. Uh, you're a joke. You're an idiot. You think no you're plane you, no plane crashed at the Pentagon. The plane in Shanksville was shot down. Holograms hit the world. There were holograms. There were bombs placed in the building. The, the, uh, uh, thermite blew up the, the towers. Uh, that's all nonsense. Like uh, All total nonsense. It, it seems way too choreographed i mean when well, i first, that, when i first started looking into it you know like you, you're telling me morgan reynolds uh, uh he was the chief economist of the bush department of labor like does he really believe the nonsense he's saying well here i went down to one of these 9-11 truth things just to see what they were up to and i said uh well, gee i found all the names of all the people that were involved they said oh, we don't care about that and i said what do you care about oh we, we just turned some science we want to know that the, the World Trade Center 7 proves our point that the, the buildings were bombed. I said, you don't want to know who's behind it? No, 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 that's not our... To, to make it nice and simple, eh? Two planes, three towers. How did the third yeah. tower fall? Yeah, just stupidity. Just stupid. And but, but the, but the, on fire. But the, stuff, on fire. the fire department knows it's going to come down, and they say, you better get the hell out of here because this building's coming down, and, and the building comes down. But And that's that's my biggest problem with, like, say, JREF and stuff. Like, look at Chris Moore, who... Uh, who showed that there was no thermite or metallic nanoparticles that brought down the World Trade Center. Therefore, I don't want to hear any more of your bullshit about 9-11 conspiracy theories. But I noticed, though, I noticed when you posted that comment a few weeks ago, he ended up posting a comment where he actually, it, it seemed to sound like he was saying that, well, maybe there could be something to this aspect of it. I've spent a lot, you know, we've all spent a lot of time debunking all this nonsense about no planes and super-duper nano thermetic materials, and then we still have this issue to deal with. Well, if you can imagine this, I was down there, and, and after I realized they are going to hit those buildings, I had this computer show in Homedale, right? That was on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday was the February 14th, so I drove up to the building as fast as I could, and I was going to go down there and show and tell myself, well, Bob, once you get in front of these buildings, you're going to realize they're just too big to collapse. And so, I'm, uh, you know, as an engineer do, the first thing you do is your numbers start flip, flipping out of your head, right? So I'm estimating the weight of the building is about 800,000 tons. And uh, you can see there was a bunch of columns in the middle and then the columns on the outside. So 400,000 tons on the outside, 400,000 tons on the inside, right, on the inside columns. And then I counted the columns across the front of the South Tower. There's 59 columns. And I thought, well, I must have made a mistake. So I counted that up five times. There's just 59 columns. Well, 59 times 4 is what? About 240, right? 240 divided into 400,000 tons is what? About a ton and a half, right? Or 1.5 thousand tons per column. So times 2,000 is you got about 3 million pounds of compression force coming down each column, outside column, like that. So my first reaction was, how the hell does that thing even stand up by itself? When you take into consideration all the factors, it's not impossible. The potential energy and the kinetic energy is well, he, massive. But here's the thing. When you were at the buildings, you realized that without the horizontal integrity of the horizontal floor joists, if, if they weren't in place and intact, the, the vertical integrity of the building wouldn't stand because, were, because the building requires three dimensions. You've got to hold it top to bottom, left to right, and front to back. Once the trusses are ripped away from the outside columns, it had no front to back support. They were going to fly in or fly out, and all things are going to come down like a house of flapjacks. You obviously, from what you just said, you know about engineering. Yep. What 
would you say about like uh, Stephen Jones and oh, yeah. for 9/11 and all uh-huh. those guys? Are they just or, scoundrels looking? They're just scoundrels. They're just scoundrels trying to get publicity for themselves by by hanging on to a, a horrific event. They're just they're all scoundrels. And they're just the, the misdirecting guys. misdirecting the question of oh gee how did the towers come down by super nano banana thermite? Oh yeah, who's it? This uh, and that uh, that Gage. that distracts. And that distracts from all the serious issues of 9-11 because all these 9-11 truthers, all they know how to do is talk about, ooh, Building 7. Building 7. Explain Building 7. You can't. Yeah, that's just stupid. It's utter stupid. It's utter, utter complete stupidity promulgated by this guy, uh, David uh, Ray Griffin, who's just a complete... Oh, what guy. a scumbag that guy what is. What a utter scumbag he is. He's, and the same yeah. thing with everybody. They all seem to be profiting off this Yep, year. they're all trying to make money on it. But, but here's the thing. Think, just think of the fact that we knew the attack was going to come. We knew who the people were involved, and then it was shut down by the CIA. These investigations were all shut down by Wilshire working with his criminally corrupted. Yeah, but it wasn't just one per- It wasn't just one group because okay, say say Wilshire and those guys shut down the Al Midar Al Hamzi connection, but then Able Danger, uh, according to Anthony Schaefer, he they identified three of the four cells, including the Al Midar Al Hazmi cell in San Diego. So they, they identified two more cells which include the Hamburg cell, I guess. Um and they were shut down by Rob Eisler from uh the the DOD. But the problem is these guys can always lie and say the lawyers told us that we couldn't give this information to the FBI. Yeah but the thing is it wasn't just said. one thing. Like Jim D told me. He's like, Okay, you want to take Clark's uh excuse of Okay, the CIA was trying to recruit Al Midar and Al Hazmi as oh, double agents yeah. or whatever. Well, then, what's the if that's the excuse for the Al Midar Al Hazmi connection? What's the excuse for the other connections? Because they knew about all the cells. So, were they trying to recruit all those terrorists? It doesn't make sense because they knew about all of them. Because between Schaefer and Able Danger, where he identified three of them, and Rod Eisler shoots uh, stops him. You got the CIA NSA connection to the Yemen hub, where they got the whole communication hub between Osama and all the Al Qaeda operatives. You know what is the excuse? If Clark's excuse is legitimate for Al Midar and Al Hazmi, no, oh, that's just baloney. That's just baloney. Then what? What's the excuse for the other cells? Why was Able Danger shut down? Yeah, I didn't find even one word that they were that they even had contact with Midhar and Hosman. If they didn't contact him, how were they going to recruit him? Nobody even talked to him. Oh, within the CIA, no one. Yeah, nobody contact. never ever even talked to him. So they're just following him with no contact. Well, they knew they'd come in the United States, and they didn't. They didn't follow him. They didn't do anything. They just let him come in the United States and let him wander around the United States. And there's another thing too. Even if they were trying to recruit them as. Uh, Agents, how long would they take to do that? Because how long did they know about them? Well, 98, 96, 98. How long does it take before you know you're going to recruit them or not? Yeah. So the whole issue is, uh, I mean, you, you've got a good point. It's really frustrating to deal with this. Now, like I say, my book didn't get as much press as I was hoping it was going to get. But, see, I published it myself. I didn't bring it to a publisher because I thought, well, you what publisher is going to put up with this kind of shit, right? You put your book out. As far back as I could find is 2006, you say 2004. No, 2006. I started the book in 2004. Okay, so since 2006, I've been looking into 9-11, and I never came across Robert Schultmeyer or his book or his website, Events on 9-11. But your, your information's been out there for all these years where nobody hears of it, but they all hear that no plane hit the Pentagon. Yep. You know no, what I mean? Because like, these truthers have real, real information gets suppressed. And like I say, the uh, I had uh, put an extremely good viewpoint of the top leadership of the Al Qaeda terrorists in my head. In fact, when I went through the different attacks that they'd taken part of to, to see if I could understand them, you know what the what they showed? What? The attack on the Tanzania and Kenya meant that uh, basically, when you when you analyze that. Basically, it meant that if they were to attack the United States, that they were going to, they knew they were going to pass through what's called a signature boundary inside the United States. If they were going to attack the United States, they were going to hit the biggest cities in the United States, which would have been New York City and Washington, D.C., and they knew it was going to be a signature event, and they knew they had to attack the biggest buildings in the biggest cities. Now, this is when I analyzed the attack on Tanzania and Kenya. When I analyzed the attack on uh, 
the coal, I realized it's time to hit the coal, that they knew they could attack any target in the United States using four weapons, secrecy, suicide, surprise, and, and psychology, mm-hmm. and that there was no way those targets could stand up to uh, their attack. So they knew they could attack the biggest buildings in the biggest U.S. cities. So even before I realized it was a World Trade Center, I had come to the conclusion that they were going after the biggest buildings in the biggest U.S. cities. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, don't the coal bombing investigators, you know, Bongart and Safan, didn't they get the lesson out of the coal? And, and then the lesson that I had got was looking at these attacks from the viewpoint of the terrorists. What were they thinking when they took part in these attacks? Well, what were you thinking when you read Sufan's book and he finally uh, explained how he went to the washroom and got sick and everything? Oh, I realized that he realized he'd been lied to. But can you imagine this? You know what Sufan and what Sufan and I have in common? Hmm. He had gotten the fatwa, the same fatwa I had used to put the whole thing together, and he'd written a report and given it to all the people in his group in the FBI. Based what on that the, same fatwa? Uh, based on that exact same fatwa. And then uh, that fatwa appeared on a website. The website is called El Quds Al Rabi by uh, uh, Abdul Atwan in uh, London. And if you can imagine that, uh, just what hour after the World Trade Center uh, South Tower fell down, Eker gets on TV and says, oh, they just found a website in London that had predicted this attack just three weeks ago. It had to be the, the Al Quds Al Rabi website by Atwan. Well, one more question that I'd like to do, uh, give me a little ex- explanation of your uh, perspective is um, when it comes to terrorists, like I know a lot of 9-11 truthers and stuff, they believe that uh, there's no such thing as real terrorists or Al-Qaeda or why were we attacked on 9-11? Was it because they hate our freedoms because we, like Michael Scheuer said, did they, did they attack us because we like to watch football and drink Budweiser or is there something more to it? The issue was they basically kind of, uh, the, the Saudis and Wahhabis and kind of hates infidels to begin with. During the 1991 Iraq war, they're trying to save Kuwait. We put our troops in Saudi Arabia. And the problem is, now think of it, if 90% of their thinking is the hereafter, and with, by putting American boots on Saudi Arabia, we do two things. First, we're besmirching their, their, their sacred shrines in Medina and Mecca. So we went and infiltrated Holy Land. Osama bin well, Laden got mad at your, uh, King Abdullah and said, why are you bringing the Americans here? We can fight these infidels. Let us do it. And he said, but no. But it's worse than that. Once an, Amer- once an infidel puts boots on Saudi soil, it smirches the relationship between a, a, a devout Muslim who wants to get in a high position in heaven and uh, his place in the hereafter. They actually, I mean, just think if you were Catholic and all of a sudden some bum walks in the in the church and then pisses on the altar. Mm-hmm. It's even worse than that. They, they thought we were we were diminishing their eternal social security, which they consider the hereafter. If we were to bomb the Hajj mm-hmm. or the Kaaba, if we were to send a bomb over there and blow that up, wouldn't that put an end Islam pretty damn quick? No, they just build another one. But but they couldn't. <laughs> that is their holy thing. Like, I mean, if we really wanted to, we could blow that up, and that would say, oh, well, there's no truth to Islam because we just blew up your hajj. No, they just go ahead and build another one. They would, that, that, to them, that's just a physical man, manifestation of the spiritual, which is uh, a nothing. Once it got blown up, I mean, it, it represents the spiritual, but once it gets blown up, they just go ahead and rebuild it. Uh, but we would have no moral authority to attack Saudi Arabia, and if we did, we'd have the whole world's worth of moral moral uh, objectors on our butt. I mean, the England, the Germany, the France, all these people, they would be furious if we attacked Saudi Arabia. So England have... and France would get mad if we blew up Saudi Arabia. Oh, they'd be furious. They'd say, because you guys have taken all your moral authority and pissed it away. You now no longer have any moral authority over anything at all. Zero. Zed. Zip. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I just know if I was uh, the commander-in-chief, I don't know what I would say. Well, uh, but but I, I know that Bush did everything he could do, Every 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 uh, 
option that we took was wrong and it just made things worse and i know that every place that we try and go and democratize or liberate ends up being an an, an, an islamic state well think of it the, the iraqi paid our guts we spent a trillion dollars we spent five thousand american troops lives and they stay, they hate our guts well what, so what, what happened what to libya what happened to libya they just, they're they're going to be an Iraqi state. What happened to Kuwait? Now they're tell, they're saying kill people for uh, whatever. What happens to uh, Afghanistan is now the worst place for women to be treated, more more so than Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah. uh, what well, happens with like Syria? That. Like every everything everywhere we go, we make things worse. What's going to happen in Egypt now? Islamists are going to take over. There, we are just enabling them. To create a cal the, that caliphate. Well, but we had no we, we had no right? say in the uh, Egyptian thing and the Syrian thing. We were staying out of Libya. All we did is bomb a few uh, places, but there was uh, realistically we didn't really had no moral authority to do that. But that yeah, but we basically. just we just opened the gates for the jihadists to take over. Well, that's the danger when you when you support one side or the other side. Both of them are going to be jihadists in some respect. One may be more jihadist than the other one, right? We we had a hand on all these Islamic states or these Middle East states by our proxy dictators that we installed. So Mubarak might have been an asshole, but you know, like we controlled him and he controlled he the asshole. population. <laughs> right? Yeah, just like Phil Donnie who said about uh, uh, about uh, Saddam on Bill O'Reilly that one time. He's like Saddam might have been an asshole, but he was our asshole. Yeah. But we can we we put these people in, and now that we're going there and we're we're supposedly uh, democratizing the Middle East, all we're doing is we're spreading Sharia law because Sharia law ends up taking over, and they're going to bring in the caliphate, and then what? Yep, and there's not nothing new about it. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I hope you take uh, can uh, talk to me again sometime, Robert, and I. Uh, Thank you very much for all the knowledge you shared with me today. It, it baffled me how a businessman that was uh, just happened to be traveling somewhere, you know, in February 2001, just happens to stumble on all this intelligence information. Well, what's in the- because everything that you've said is factual, and it's only been corroborated over time. Yeah. But it turns out I'm an engineer, and the problem with being an engineer is, is, is the first thing is you're good at solving puzzles. And the second thing is if you get a puzzle and you can't solve it, man, you, your brain just goes into hyper gear until you solve that puzzle. And, uh, well, that's, uh, a lot of the problem is, especially with uh, people as human nature, is that uh, we want answers to our unsolved questions. And you can see, like, people will make up any kind of answer to fill in the gaps when it comes to stuff like 9-11 yeah. like uh, I don't know how in this day and age of well not only that but here's the issue when you come up with that kind of bullshit you're letting the CIA get away with basically pure out and out murder, mass oh, murder. and that's exactly the same thing as like uh, Jim D said all this stupid shit that all these conspiracy theorists are spewing is just helping the criminals it's helping the criminals get away with murder. It's helping the crim- exact It's helping the criminals get away with murder. Like he said, I'm sure Dick Cheney would love that you say no plane hit the Pentagon. Yeah. He would. He would appreciate that. He would Love really. It. He would probably thank you for saying that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then totally, totally ignore the whole intelligence aspect of it, which is the main crux of the whole That's situation. That's the key. Let's think of how we can get more of this information out. We'll put some good, inform- good put some good ideas together and see what we can do. Well, you know, this is a start having us talk, and then uh, I would like uh, what I would really like is for you and Jim D to talk one day because you guys are very knowledgeable. That'd be great. Somehow, some way, the truth will always prevail. Yep. Right in the end. All right, Robert. Well, thank you very much for talking to me, and I'll keep in touch with you, and we will talk again soon. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to my conversation with businessman, engineer, author, and excellent 9-11 researcher, Robert Schultmeyer. You can find more of Robert's research at his website, eventson911.com, and in his book, Prior Knowledge of 9-11, which is also available at his website. Thank you for listening, everybody. Until next time, take care.